Good evening, everyone. My name is Lisa Sokol. I'm the Director of Community Programs in Orion Township, and I'm proud to say that this is a building that I oversee. I want to welcome you this evening for the presentations that will be made by the Coalition Against Overmedicating Our Youth. We have some really great speakers that are here tonight, so I'd like to introduce at this time Don Rush, the assistant publisher of Sherman Publications. He writes award-winning columns called Don't Rush Me. He loves long walks on the beach, and he's thrilled to be here tonight. He loves thunderstorms as well. So welcome, Don. Welcome to the uh, Health Awareness Forum. We're developing uh, a healthy mind. I'm not used to using the microphone here, so. Um, the idea tonight is to discuss changing the direction we're going in uh, assessing uh, behavioral conditions. Uh, for too long, I think, or at least the last couple decades, um, parents have taken like one suggestion before medicating their children. Today, we've uh, found out that there are a number of assessments that can go on, you know, digestive, uh, chiropractic body alignment, you know, how you come out of the birth canal, and all that kind of stuff can affect your behavior. So tonight, you know, there's not a parent in here, there's not a um, educator here, a responsible adult who doesn't want the best for their kids. But a lot of times, these decisions are made, and the, and the parents I know who have made a decision to, uh, you know, maybe go on to Ritalin or something like that, they feel a tremendous, a tremendous amount of guilt. So tonight, you know, try to educate y'all. Uh, and give you hope. There are ways to go about things. You don't have to go right into the uh, medication therapy. So uh, we have a, uh, let's see what's going on here. Let me see. Here's some interesting stuff. We have this book over here, and a newly released book, Over Medicating Our Youth, by our featured speaker, Frank Granite. Uh, the assessments and an action plan for childhood behavioral conditions are presented. If you have questions after here, we're going to have a Q&A for any of the speakers. So kind of like when they're up here, don't ask your question, but kind of like put it in your head, maybe write it down. And then when we get done, you'll have a chance to uh, ask your questions. We're also going to have a, a book signing with Frank. And uh, it, it can be a nice and formal thing here. we got a nice little crowd here, so I think we can get actually a lot done. Uh, we have special guest speakers tonight. They include Drs. John Collin. Why don't you raise your hand or stand up? John? Uh, Jason Mollison. And we have registered nurses, and I'm going to say it wrong, Houston. Yeah, stand up. And <laughs> Birgit McQuiston, please stand up. Our first speaker tonight is former president of the Michigan Chiropractic Council. Is that correct? All right. He has appeared in over 50 TV and uh, radio programs about chiropractic care. Uh, he has won the Distinguished Fellow Award for Chiropractic Care and currently owns and operates President, CEO, Head Muckety Muck of Cowan Chiropractic in Clarkston. So let's uh, give a hand to Dr. John Cowan. Thank you very much. Take a big breath. It's okay. You know, what I think in this concept of trying to understand ADD and ADHD, let me just maybe first spend a second talking about how I even got involved. Um, about six, seven, eight weeks ago, one of my patients um, approached me and came in and, and, and told me about Frank and Frank's book. And I had no idea the problem that existed in this realm of ADD and ADHD. Um, as we'll get into in just a few minutes, I, I, I know we have a drug problem in our country, and I know that drugs are overprescribed way, way too often. Um, but I didn't realize the direction it had taken on our youth. Um, maybe I'm a little insulated. Being a chiropractor, I don't take medications. Uh, I, in the last 40 years, I had pneumonia back in 1997, and I took a five-day regime of, of penicillins and I was better. That's it. So that's my only exposure to medication. So I, I'm probably not the, the best example of what do you do with drugs because I, I don't know. Um, but I do know that uh, there's some big changes that need to be made 
in all of our thinking when it comes to medications because there are some medications like this penicillin product saved my life. I probably wouldn't be here had I not taken it. But I don't see the reason a lot of times for the abuse of it. So let me start with that. This book, again, enlightened me on ADD and ADHD. Uh, I've had the opportunity of, of, of meeting with Frank just a couple times, but I love his demeanor, I love his enthusiasm, but most of all, I love his commitment. Um, this guy has turned this into a life's work. And, you know, anytime anybody finds something that they're strong enough about to make it a life's work, they're, they're a very, very lucky individual. But there'll be a lot of bridges along the way that they must cross because there's a, always a lot of people that just don't think exactly like you do. So if you haven't yet purchased a copy of this book, make sure you do. I mean, it's a, it's a great thing. Um, we've been giving them out in our office. I didn't realize how many teachers we had for patients. Um, and so we're making sure that everybody's getting their free copy. Uh, we had one of our patients uh, whose husband's a, a medical physician and, 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 um, and she's, uh, she's a patient, her husband's both, and they're both patients. Um, ran for school board. I wished I'd given her the book before. You know, it would give her even some more to talk to. She only lost by 56 votes. Anyway, I'm a chiropractor, practiced in Clarkston for the last 37 years. Um, I, I, I guess I understand where Frank's at right now. I, was, I feel very lucky. I found that passion in my life that just consumed me, and I've had a ball with it. Um, I've, I've been honored to be president of my state chiropractic association, probably one of the coolest absolute coolest things I ever did in my life was when George Bush Sr. was running for President of the United States. I helped him in his campaign because Brooks Patterson at the time was a, was a patient of mine and, and I was close with, with John Engler at the time who was our governor. And, um, or he was involved in the Senate at the time, later became governor. Um, and became a little part of the George Bush Sr. Dan Quayle campaign for President of the United States. And, uh, when the whole thing was said and done, I got a call to the, from, from the White House and, and uh, got a chance to go there. And I took the uh, president of the American Chiropractic Association with me, the National Association at the time. We have an International Chiropractic Association, but I had to take an organization that represented a lot of people, and American people, and so on. And so I took the president with me, and we arrived in front of the White House. And uh, anyway, it was very, very impressive because circling the entire White House along that circular drive going up to the front door was hundreds of military people in full dress with guns and everything over their shoulder. And the president of the American Medical Association looked at me and said, Cowan, you're amazing. He said, you can really put together a crowd. I said, well, this is really, really good. I said, but we have the first appointment. The second one was the, uh, the president of Egypt at the time. So that's who all these other people were for. We got to go in the old door, in the back door through the old executive office. But anyway, we were able to submit names for the appointments of chiropractors to the Department of Health and Human Services, which went, at the time was a very, very big, big thing for our profession because we were seen as the, uh, the crazy guys in the, in the wood shop sometimes. So, Anyway, that was, that was one of the things I really enjoyed, but most of all, I enjoy every day getting up and going to my practice. It's a great thing. So needless to say, in the last 37 years, I've seen a lot of changes. And one of the things I've seen is the overprescription of medication, which I think is very, very unfortunate. But the question is, is how, how did it happen? How did this just sort of slide by us? How did we all of a sudden start taking all these drugs? Well. To me, there's a, a great principle that, that uh, it's, I call it the frog principle. Do you know that if you put a, a frog into boiling water, that the frog will just jump out? But if you put a frog into cold water and just turn up the heat and let the water slowly get warmer and warmer and warmer, the frog will stay in there till he cooks. So the moral of that story is, is if things happen fast in our lives, they demand attention from us. If they happen slowly, we don't even notice it. Well, do you know that in 1990, the annual expenditure for prescription drugs in this country was $40 billion. Now, just 22 years later, somehow it's become $234.1 billion, sixfold more. Are we that sick? Are we that much sicker? Is our life expectancy that much longer? I don't think the answer to any of those questions is really, yeah, no, it is, because it's not. This year, in fact, we're going to spend 
uh, in the vicinity of $2.5 trillion in this country on health care. And another startling fact is, in this country, we represent 5%, 5% of the world's population. There's almost 7 billion others out there that represent the rest of the population. But do you know that we, as a country, with a population of 315 million people at this moment, take 50% of every drugs, all the drugs that are made in the world, 50% of them are consumed right here by us, by our 5% of the population. So you'd say, well, we should, <laughs> what's going to be the return on investment? We should be pretty doggone healthy around here. Well, are we? I don't think so. We, if you go to the, the World Health Organization, they say that we rank only 37th in the world in overall health care. Costa Rica, you have a better chance of staying healthy there than you do in our country. Now, the question be is, how can, this, how can this be? And herein to me, let me lay the groundwork for what I oversee as the problem with whether it's ADD, ADHD, back problems, whatever the case might be is, I was at the mall, and it was around Christmas time. And as I walked through the mall, in the crowds, the throngs of people, I looked over and I saw this little gal that had been a patient. I had not seen her in some time. And I said, Mary, we'll call her Mary. I said, Mary, I haven't seen you for a while. She said, oh, well, I've been great since you fixed me up. I said, well, I sure miss you. I'd like to see you back in the office. And she said, well, I'll be back when I need you. Well, that sort of stuck with me a little bit. She needed me. What did she mean by that? Well, she, like the rest of the nation, had taken on the mindset that we don't do anything for ourselves until we feel that there's something wrong. We have a headache, we have a symptom, our back hurts, uh, we have a behavior problem, whatever the case might be. I was at a class reunion not too long ago. Um, I believe I'm 29 years old, but my wife tells me I'm getting older. Um, but I, I ran into an old friend of mine, I used to swim back in high school on the swimming team. And I ran into an old guy that uh, was on the team with me that was a, just a great friend, and he was in such good shape at the time. And when I saw them, all of a sudden, I saw him, all of a sudden, he, he wasn't in good shape anymore. Um, he had probably put on 100 pounds more than he should. And as we talked, we were talking about health problems, and I said, Harry, are, are, you, are you healthy? Because I looked at him thinking, well, I don't know how he could be. He said, oh, gosh, yeah, I'm, I'm really healthy. I said, well, you don't have anything like high blood pressure, high cholesterol, things like that? He said, oh, no, I don't have any of that stuff. I take pills for that. See, and he had the mindset that because he took the pills, he didn't have the problem anymore. Oh, boy, that's not good. Because unfortunately, somewhere along the line, we have taken on that attitude that if we don't feel something, then we must be okay. Now, let's take that logic a step further. The Centers for Disease Control that say, says that almost 70% of the people in our country that die before their 78th birthday die because they either smoke, they're overweight, or they don't exercise. Not rocket science, just those three things. Now, think about that for a second. If you're a smoker, why quit smoking if you don't feel anything wrong? If you're obese, why, why go struggle through a diet if you don't feel anything wrong? And, and so on. Why go to the gym at 5 o'clock in the morning? My wife asks, us, asks me that every morning. Why are we getting up? Well, because this is what we do. And lately, it's been the other way around. But anyway, um, it's just... It's the mindset that as long as nothing hurts, everything must be okay. It's sort of like having your burglar alarm go off in the middle of the night. And because the noise bothers you, you turn the burglar alarm off without any attention to the burglar. You know, you have to sort of try and understand what that symptom really, really means. Um, Stephen Case, and let me just read this because this to me was a, a shocker back in 2010 when Obamacare and so on was just starting to take effect in the country. And, and I, I don't know to this day if any of us really understand what's in there, but he said he represents the Case Foundation. He said, the truth is our country doesn't have a health care system. He says, we have a sick care system. He said, take a hard look at our real underlying disease, the lifestyle choices we make every day that lead to more sickness and thus more cost. Doing what we can to avoid getting sick must be a commitment each of us makes to ourselves, our family, and our community. Lifestyle choices, again, CDC, 70% of the people die from one of those three things, smoking, obesity, or lack of exercise. Everybody here has seen Dr. Oz, right? Dr. Oz is my hero. And the reason he's my hero is he's introduced us 
to a new form of medicine called functional medicine. And if you look hard enough around town, there is some wonderful functional medicine doctors in our communities. The unfortunate part is, is insurance companies don't reimburse for it, things like that, because it falls under the guise of prevention. We don't pay for prevention, which would be health care as far as I'm concerned. We only pay for sick care. You got to get sick first, then we can go home. But anyway, Dr. Oz represents this whole field of functional medicine. Now there's functional medicine, what it tries to do is it tries to change the current model of health care from symptom treatment to finding out what the cause of a problem is. And let me read this to you too, as I went to the Functional Medicine Institute to try and understand what was their thinking. What could I share with you tonight as to what this new form of medical health care really is all about? Well, I found their, their policy statement. It says, functional medicine is an evolution in the practice of medicine that better addresses the health care needs of the 21st century. By shifting the tradi traditional disease-centered focus of medical practice to a more patient-centered approach, functional medicine addresses the whole person, not just an isolated set of symptoms. Functional medicine practitioners spend time with their patients, listening to their histories and looking at their interactions among genetics, environmental factors, lifestyle factors, things that can influence long-term health and complex chronic disease. In this way, functional medicine supports the unique expression of health and vitality for each individual. Our society, as speaking of the Functional Medicine Society, is experiencing a sharp increase in the number of people who suffer from complex chronic diseases such as diabetes, heart disease, cancer, mental illness, and autoimmune disorders. The current system, yeah, the current system of medicine practiced by most physicians is oriented towards acute care, which is the, which is the diagnosis and treatment of trauma or illness that is of short-term duration and in need of urgent care, such as an appendicitis or a broken bone. Unfortunately, though, the acute care approach to medicine lacks the proper methodology and tools for, for, for preventing and treating complex chronic disease. There is a huge gap between current research and the way the doctors practice. The gap between emergency, emerging research in the basic sciences and integration into medical practices is enormous, particularly in the area of chronic illness. Most physicians are not adequately trained to assess the underlying causes of complex chronic disease and to apply strategies such as nutrition, diet, and exercise to both treat and prevent illnesses in their patients. When was the last time you went to your doctor and said, here, look, I, I, I'm healthy as a horse. I'd like to sit down and talk to you a little bit about what I eat. I'd like to talk to you about uh, diet and weight. How, how am I gonna lose weight? Especially if you look across the table, maybe he's not representing what do you think he should be representing? Or the direction that you're trying to take your life in? Um, so functional medicine involves understanding the origins, prevention, and treatment of complex chronic disease. The focus of functional medicine is on patient-based care, promoting health as a positive vitality beyond just the absence of symptoms. Functional medicine practitioners look upstream to consider the complex web of interactions in the patient's history, physiology, and lifestyle that can lead to illness. The unique genetic makeup of each patient is considered, along with both internal and ex external factors that affect total functioning. Function functional medicine integrates traditional Western medicine practices with what is sometimes considered alternative or integrative medicine, creating a focus on prevention through nutrition, diet, and exercise, use of the latest laboratory testing and other diagnostic techniques, and prescribed combinations of drugs and or bot botanical uh, medic medicines, supplements, therapeutic diets, detoxification programs, or stress management techniques. Let me share some of the strategic plan of the Functional Medicine Institute. And I just want to read this too so that we have it right. The rapidly spreading epidemic of chronic disease, and remember that's seven out of every 10 people that die in our country die from a chronic disease has compromised the effectiveness of our health care system and threatens to bankrupt both the national and global economies. Alarming projections suggest that if current trends continue, future generations will have a shorter and less healthier life than the adults of today. Current models of clinical medicine are outdated and do not address the underlying cause and solutions for chronic disease, which are primarily driven by lifelong daily interaction between an individual's genetic 
environment, and lifestyle choices. Functional medicine offers a powerful new operating system and clinical model for assessment, treatment, and prevention of chronic disease to replace the outdated and ineffective acute models carried forward from the 20th century. And again, functional medicine incorporates the latest in genetic science, systems biology, and understands and the understanding of how environmental and lifestyle factors influence the emergence and progression of disease. Functional medicine enables physicians and other healthcare professionals to practice proactive, predictive, personalized medicine and empowers patients to take an active role in their own health. Let's look at two approaches to healthcare. Let's say that an obese patient presents. We're in a clinical environment right now, and an obese patient just presents himself for care. Now, if I am a traditional physician, I will do a workup on that patient. And if I find that that patient has high blood pressure, what am I going to do? I'm going to treat the high blood pressure. If he has high cholesterol, what am I going to do? I'm going to treat the high cholesterol. I'm going to go through a plethora of symptoms and symptom treatment because of certain symptoms that this patient has. Now tell me something. Do you think that the obesity might have an influence in this person's overall health? Functional medicine addresses the hard part, the bad lifestyle choices. Functional medicine says, okay, what are we eating? Um, what can we do to lose weight? And they spend time working, and, and again, there's a lot of genetic causes for that too, but all this is overcome and can be overcome. So normally, the left unchecked, the, that patient's going to be put on a series of different medications and so on, and it's going to end up, as time goes along, with other problems. So what we call that is we call those downline diseases. So we have the obese patient, and you know what the downline diseases are. I pulled this from the Centers of Disease for Disease Control. Coronary heart disease, stroke, high blood pressure, type 2 diabetes, how much do you hear of that nowadays, endometrial, breast and colon cancer, high cholesterol, high triglycerides, liver and gallbladder disease, sleep apnea, respiratory problems, bone degeneration, osteoarthritis, reproductive health complications such as infertility, and mental health conditions. And again, the current approach is to treat those symptoms as they develop. But functional medicine doctor says, no, let's go out there and let's treat the obesity. We can deal with the symptoms, yes, because if they're of critical nature, but let's also treat the obesity. Because left unchecked with just the medications, does anybody know of a medication other than a, an acute medication, like, uh, like when I had the pneumonia and so on, that actually cures anything? There's not a lot of those out there. What it does is it chemically alters your system enough so that the high blood pressure and the high cholesterol and things like that are kept in check. But that's part of the problem, because rather than being treated properly, this little acute problem later becomes a chronic problem because the initial cause is not, not addressed. The Harvard Center for Disease, Preven for, for Disease Prevention says that 80% in our country of the cases of heart disease and diabetes and 70% of the cases of stroke and 50% of the cases of cancer could be avoided by just addressing the functional problem. More than two-thirds of the problem. So why am I sharing this with you? I mean, this really has nothing to do with chiropractic, right? Well, that's not true. Every day in our office, I wish I was the first line of defense for a lot of people that have back trouble or problems associated with their spine, but I'm not. Usually, after everything else has failed, they're knocking on my door. Well, originally, when that person had a problem, what do you think he was treated with? Pain pills, muscle relaxers, so on. Normally, a lot of these people, by the time they walk in my office, they've been working with these acute problems that come closer together, that seem to last longer, that are easy, more easily initiated, until finally, it's to the point it's just not going away anymore. And now we're doing MRIs, and we're going through all these fantastic procedures. And I'm the only thing standing between them and maybe stenosis surgery or, or some terrible thing like that. Well, the problem is, is somewhere early on, if that functional problem had been addressed and that spine made stable from a standpoint of dealing with it functionally, that person would have never had to have gone through all this stuff. And so. I, I pulled a study out for us. I, I went to the Blue Cross Blue Shield of California. And Blue Cross Blue Shield of California had a big study on chiropractic. They took 700,000 people that had chiropractic coverage and a million 
that had the same policy but without the chiropractic component. And what do you think they found as far as treating this thing from a functional standpoint? There was a 41% reduction in back pain and related hospitalizations in the people that took the functional approach in chiropractic. And there was a 32% decrease in back surgeries. And remember, I'm not seeing these people most of the time until they're on the edge. Well, my point of all this stuff is, is through reading Frank's book and HD and HD, you know, the, the, this, this process of throwing drugs at these poor kids. Had a patient yesterday. Came to the office, we're talking about this little meeting tonight. She said, oh, I know, I've been through it. She said, the hardest day of my life was walking out of the doctor's office after my son had just had that first drug. She said, that night, he just became almost unresponsive. He sat, almost sat in the corner. He was no longer a part of the family. She said, I felt so bad. She said, I cried all night long. And the next day, I got up, and I thought, there's got to be a better way. And she found somebody that was in functional medicine. And this was five, six, seven years ago. And went, started going through these series of exams and tests and so on. And, and you know what they found? This little kid had a gluten intolerance. Changed his diet, the ADD symptoms went away. I started looking through chiropractic research. What did we have in chiropractic research that would possibly have an effect on ADHD or HDD? Um, or ADD, I mean. And in, that, in one of the studies I found, the cervical spine through delivery, of course, we're carrying his babies like this. When we're birthing a baby, what's the first thing they do? As soon as the head crowns, they grab it and they turn it a quarter turn to speed up the delivery of the shoulders and pull. Well, it might speed up the process, but what's it doing to the neck? If I turned your neck a quarter of a turn and pulled like that, it's not going to help. And because of all the nerves that are passing through that neck and the sensitivity of them, things can happen. So we've been, there, there is research going on at this very moment outside of the chiropractic profession on chiropractic and the relationship between cervical um, displacement and ADD, and there's a lot of positive things coming out. Kids that have been diagnosed with ADD, that are on the medication, that are back in their physician's offices, and the, the physician is taking them off the medication because they no longer have the symptoms of ADD. So I think that you know, there's a, a positive spot for all of us here on this thing, and I think that the, the commonality that I have with Frank and his, his dedication to this, and the dedication that I have in my office, and, and I'm sure the dedication you have with yours, is we all want to see our people get better. And we want to do that in the least amount of dis with the least amount of destruction to their body. And uh, in so doing, that means then that what we ultimately want to do is we want to look for this functional cause. And if that functional cause is something that we can target and deal with without the use of medications and drugs, then that's what we're going to do. And with Frank and Ann, these are people that, that, that that's what they do. And um, anyway, I, I'm just I'm feeling really uh, happy to be uh, associated with Frank, with Ann, and so on, because all of us have a part in this big picture. And I, I hope that tonight, when we get done, that all of you ask a lot of questions, because what I have seen as I interview patients that are teachers, that are uh, moms and dads that have kids that are, are having ADD problems and so on, is everybody has their own personal feeling about this thing. And in some of the cases, I probably wouldn't agree with the approach that they're taking. Uh, I, I think a lot of times we make things too simple. But um, anyway, let me, let me end with that. And I guess next up is Ann. Good. Thank you very much. As Dr. Cohen has so astutely Pronounced. Anne is our next speaker. Anne is. Uh, let me see. What, are, what about you, Anne? You are a certified lifestyle educator, an electrodermal screening specialist, and you've been affiliated with the Downing Clinic for the last five years. Is that about right? Seven years. Seven years. Or since 2005. All right. Uh, welcome, Anne Eusted. Thank you. 
screening. And um, I work at the Downing Clinic. I'm a registered nurse, too. And in addition to the other things, I really, this has been exciting to get to know Frank. And I need a copy of your book to show up here. But I've been uh, looking through his book. We've been selling it at the clinic and um, passing it out to people. And it, uh, to see that there is more people that understand this problem than just us because it's been kind of a lonely battle sometimes. We actually have been, I deal with a lot of children that come to the clinic and they're looking for something else to do besides the medications. Uh, they're looking for something to make their life a better quality, to help them with depression or anxiety, uh, with stomach aches, with um, different kinds of digestive problems. Digestive problems are included quite often whenever there's some kind of mood disorder because so many of the neurotransmitters are really connected to what goes on inside the gut. And there's just so many connections to the whole body and people are looking for other answers. We have uh, a doctor at our office, Dr. Laura Kowalsik. She's a DO, uh, board certified internal medicine. And she is, uh, has, actually they've been my doctor since 1997. I've been a patient there. And then they offered that I could come and work for them, and I started getting advanced training in the electrodermal screening. And anyway, we do uh, integrative medicine, which is uh, like functional medicine that uh, Dr. Cowan was talking about, that we, uh, we use uh, vitamins, herbs, minerals, um, as often as possible, prescriptions if we have to. And uh, prescriptions a lot of times are used as a... Uh, kind of a bridge to waiting for the body to start coming on board and working because a lot of what is what we do with the health is help the body to start working right well it didn't start malfunctioning overnight and so it's not going to start working right overnight so it takes time for all of these things to happen so we um, one of the methods that we use of testing is the electrodermal screening, which I do 9 to 5, Monday through Friday. And I love it because it is just so fascinating to see what the body has to say. The body actually is talking all the time about what it needs and what is going on. It's just that we don't know how to listen to it. You know, like Dr. Cowan was mentioning, we wait for symptoms to happen. I can actually see with the electrodermal screening long before there's any symptoms, even long before there's blood tests that show that there's a problem. This is a method of testing that uses the electromagnetic system in the body. The system, the same, it's a, there's electromagnetics inside of us, and it may sound strange to talk about that, but actually it's the same electromagnetics that an MRI would make an image of. Magnetic resonance imaging is an MRI. And so I can actually um, measure the electrical resistance of those kinds of energies by using, this is an ohm meter. It just, it measures electrical resistance sort of like an electrician would use to check outlets and wires and see what the electrical resistance is. And uh, I, we can measure the pathways that are just under the skin. They're the same kind of pathways that an acupuncturist would treat. I usually check around 40 or 50 points on the hands and the toes and the side of the head. Um, and I'll demonstrate here in a moment with Mr. Rush. Oh, he's even got his shoe off. Oh my gosh, he wasn't going to take his shoe off for me. <laughs> so anyway, we're going to show it just a real quick demo. And to show you that uh, there's actually 800 points on the body. Um, and I only get into uh, extra points as during visits when I find that a person needs to have some extra screening. So I can see a lot of what's going on in the body because I know the pattern of what the reading should be. And um, we're going to do a little demo so you can, it's easier to see than it is to talk about. Right, so bring your chair. Bring my chair. Yeah, bring, I'll need a chair too.
might explain something. <laughs> yeah. The first thing I do is um, see how the body, the overall conductance is. So this is the ground for the ohm meter. And um, this is a, a ground that he's just holding so that I can compare. This? Yep. <laughs> it's only one and a half volts. <laughs> I should turn the sound up so you guys can hear this. Yes, uh, his reading is 90. It's supposed to be 75 to 85. It's called adrenal overload <laughs> from, <laughs> from being excited today. <laughs> so, all right. All right, I checked the side of the head, and I'm going to keep this wet now. And uh, I need your glass. Yep. I checked the side of the head because there is, um, I can check the hypothalamus which runs the automatic functions in a body. Ruh -ruh, that didn't sound good. It sounded just fine. That was uh, almost right on the money. 82 is the sweet point, and that's 81.80. OK, and that's pretty much matching, so that looks good. And I can check to see what's happening in the body. This is another part of the screening. And I check the hand. Right hand lymphatic, CMP. So I can check the lymphatic. Right hand lung, CMP. Right hand large intestine. Normally, I have the hand stabilized and get little smoother readings. Right hand nerve, CMP. Right hand circulation, CMP. Right hand allergy, CMP. Right hand organ, CMP. And so right on. Then I, I can check the foot too. All right, give me your foot. I have a little stool at the office, and I wear my gloves. <laughs> That's the pancreas. Right hand heart. Oops. CMP. Uh, or not? Yes. <laughs> okay. This is the liver. Okay. And so on. And I would um, go through all those readings and be able to see what is going on in the body. I look to see how high the reading goes and whether the electromagnetic um, frequency is staying stable or whether it's falling downhill. And then I can, once I have all the readings, it's the first of three steps of the electrodermal screening. The second part of the program is of the testing is to actually introduce other readings. So then I can turn on uh, other readings such as um, different products is what I usually do as a shortcut is to check different products. So there are products um, because products are all made of atoms that have energy in them, you know, energy. Uh, like vitamins, minerals, everything's made of atoms. And the energy then has a little radio wave, a little radio frequency. And so they put the radio signature, the radio frequency into the software, and it can broadcast from the meter. And it broadcasts about six to eight feet. And um, then I can, when I'm broadcasting them, I can see how those affect the patient's own readings and then see how their readings change from what I'm doing. So um, then I can tell what's going on. This way I can measure to see if what's disturbing the person's system. Things such as um, heavy metal toxicity. Um, there's uh, over there on the table 
It has um, information on foods and products that have MSG, which is something I can measure for, or the propylene glycol, different kinds of chemicals. And these things all can cause different kinds of toxicities and problems in people. So I can measure for those kinds of things. And then the, the last part of the stage is to find out what type of products are actually going to help the person feel better. And of course, when it comes to healing, it usually takes more than one visit to really solve the whole problem because we have to help the body at one step and then help it to the next step. And so these are the kind of things that Frank has talked about in his book that uh, to help us to be able to not have to take so many medications. I loved the, uh, the statistic he had in there that 80% of the people that are on medications for ADD, ADHD, and depression, and those things, actually if they would use lifestyle methods of choices, that they would be able to you know, overcome a lot of their issues and not have to do the medications. Yeah, we're a doctor's office, and we're on Sashabaw Road, yeah. And I can answer more questions during the Q&A time. Yeah, so. Um, we have, I, I see, I see I, but a few weeks ago I had um, a run on eight and nine-year-old boys. It was really interesting because I had, and they weren't related. And I don't know, I just, um, and I thought maybe they'd been referred by you, but they'd never heard of you. <laughs> so, but they, they all had some kind of um, uh, problems with focusing at school or problems with sitting still at, at school, um, some kind of behavior issues. One was having trouble eating and was throwing up. And had had the problem with throwing up when he was uh, first born, and it had kind of outgrown it, and then it was coming back. And so one case I found the little boy had heavy metal toxicity. I believe it was from arsenic in the, if I can remember right, that uh, arsenic, because there's a lot of arsenic in the well water around here. And so, um, that was one of the issues, and so then I started him on a program to help his pathways in his body to start opening up, to start being able to remove the, some of the burden that his body is dealing with so that the body can communicate better. Another one had a fungus yeast overgrowth in the intestines that's called candida. So this candida overgrowth actually creates a lot of neurological problems, a lot of problems with... Um, uh, agitation and forgetfulness and um, problems with um, anger or irritation. I actually have seen, I don't usually talk to the patients about this, but I know that the, the staff and I talk about it and say, well, just give that person a break. They've got candida because there is a candida personality that I've seen, a very intense, very high-wired person. By the second or third month that I've been seeing them, they're now calm, cool, collected, just like just like they'd want to be. <laughs> so there's, because of the toxicity and what their body is dealing with, then those kinds of things need to be dealt with. And in that case, the candida gets dealt with with using um, certain products that we have to help uh, kill off the candida, help to remove some of the toxins associated with it, and also changing their eating habits. They've got to get rid of all the sugar and fruit juice and eat more um, more sweet potatoes and squash and some other types of things. So there's a lot of things that we deal with at the office. And um, Dr. Kowalczyk, she is, because she's internal medicine, she sees children that are 16 and over. So she deals mostly with adults. I see anybody any age. I can see infants and, uh, and younger children. And then, um, but with Dr. Kowalczyk, she sees them 16 and over because that's what her her license is chosen for internal medicine. And when, uh, a lot of times what the, what the people need is, because uh, I was thinking, I was looking through some of my records today to see some of the people that we've helped. And there was a 24-year-old uh, young man that when he came to our office, he has um, a, a mild case of Asperger's. It's a mild, real low on the spectrum of autism. And he was having trouble with focusing and having trouble being able to follow through with anything that he was doing. And so he saw Dr. Kowalczyk first and went through some a urine test from neuroscience and got on um, 
no, he, he went through a different test. That was before neuroscience. Anyway, a different one. He, and he used some amino acids. And amino acids just changed how he was feeling and thinking. You could just see he, he started communicating and talking to me more. And um, I could just see the difference in how he could socialize. So there's a lot of things that can be done that uh, aren't common knowledge. So we wanted to make that clear today. Thank you. That was very interesting, and we are not going to read those results because I'm sure they're not that great. <laughs> well, it, talking about arsenic, uh, I live in Goodrich and Wellwater, and that community, uh, the arsenic levels are like, whoosh. as a matter of fact, one of the schools had to get some kind of uh, system up there to get the arsenic out, so I should probably have the same thing at my house, but I'm the cheapest guy in town. Just remember that. Uh, up next are Dr. <laughs> Uh, J Jason Olofsson and R.N. Burgett McQuiston. They are from the uh, Custom Health Center here in o Lake Orion. Uh, recently, you might not know this, Jason was voted the top chiropractor by our Detroit Magazine. Is that correct? Yes, sir. All right. Uh, two years running. And uh, Burgett, you might know her. her. She's a nutritionist, and she's also on the uh, Orion School Board. So you guys going to like one at a time or together? It's your call. I'll call her up. All right, you call her up. Excellent. Thank you. How's everybody doing? Good. You learning some stuff? I know I learned some stuff from Dr. Cowan and Ann. <clears throat> I hadn't ever seen that system demonstrated before. So that was really interesting. Um, <clears throat> I want to start with who I am and how, what drew me to this. Because if you would have talked to me about 10 years ago, I... Um, I'm seeing Clarkston guys back here. This is great. <laughs> Good. All right. I graduated from Clarkston High School. Um, I, so I'm a local guy, and about 10 years ago, I was in pharmaceutical sales. Um, I, I was the, the guy in the fancy suit and tie that would walk into every doctor's office and sell, sell the doctors the drugs that, that people were taking. And what I noticed in that industry as, as my time went on was that the whole industry was dedicated to keeping people on drugs instead of helping them fix the cause in their body and then getting them off of the drugs. I'm not against drugs if they're used appropriately. Um, and I think that every single person in the room tonight would, would definitely agree with that. Um, in, in a crisis, thank God we've got, we've got drugs. Thank God we've got, if you get in a car accident and you break, break your arm, or my brother dropped a, a, about a 500-pound slab of granite on his foot about three hours ago, and we took x-rays in my office, and, and it's broken. Um, so thank God there's, there's some pain medication for my brother because he was hurting pretty bad. But if, if what I noticed was that if we were looking at drugs to keep us well for a lifetime, they weren't doing a very good, good, uh, a good job of that. So... I was sitting one day in a meeting in, as a pharmaceutical rep, and um, my manager stood in front of us and she said, you know, the beauty of our drugs is that once somebody gets on them, they're on them for the rest of their lives, and we get to make money on every script. I sat back and I, that, that one comment right there, that one comment made me sit back and go, I can't do this anymore. I want, to be a, I want to be a part of the solution rather than a part of the cause of the problems. Because the, the longer I was in pharmaceutical sales, the more I saw people getting worse and worse and worse on the drugs that I sold. And so um, I, I want to, um, I want to get it, basically I, I wanted to be um, somebody who, who could really work with somebody to educate them and, and take that, their bodies to the next level. So. Um, as Dr. Cowan said over here, we've, we've got a pretty big ep epidemic in, in our society. We're 4.4% of the world's population. We take over 50% of the world's drugs. 
if you let that sink in, my goodness, we've got more pharmacies, hospitals, doctor's offices per capita than anywhere else in the world. And we, we spent $2.5 trillion on health care. If drugs and surgeries and more doctor's offices, made us, doctor's offices and hospitals and pharmacies made us the healthiest people in the world, or made us healthy, what would we be? We'd, we'd be the healthiest people in the world, wouldn't we? And yet we're, we're failing pretty miserably at a lot of this. So um, my office is called the Custom Health Center. I graduated from chiropractic school, and my, my goal is to customize a health plan for every single person that comes in the door. You've heard some great information about electrodermal screening and, and uh, functional medicine tonight. And I actually try to incorporate all of that into the office. We, we work on five different things in my office. We work on five shifts to somebody's lifestyle. So we want to shift someone's health to the next level. And it's S-H-I-F-T. We work on, first of all, we, the foundation of the office is the skeletal structure. We really want to, we want to change your skeletal structure from being something that, that the average American looks like, which, you know, has forward head posture or no curve in the neck or, or slouching all day um, because of how much we sit in our chairs and how much we look at computers, all of that. And we want to, we want to get you in an upright posture because what science tells me is that my goodness, if your posture's good and your brain can talk adequately to your body, you'll function at a higher rate. I think that's pretty important. Headspace is the next shift that we work on. So we work with uh, counselors and, and uh, I do a lot of seminars in the office about, about how we can shift our headspace to, to wrap our heads around the fact that if we think positively, we actually will function better. And, and thoughts are things is, is one of the things that, that I, I talk about. I is the intake of nutrients. This is actually my intake of nutrients uh, book. This is where Birgit comes in. Birgit is uh, an RN as well as a registered, or she is a RN and a clinical nutritionist. Um, I have every single person who signs a care plan in my office meet with Birgit because we want to make sure that, that the, the first thing that, that they're thinking is, wow, this isn't just structure. We're going we're gonna to change the, the intake of nutrients in, with somebody as well. Um, because, man, if, if I adjust and I adjust and I adjust and the person goes home and eats McDonald's and Twinkies and it follows it off with ice cream and alcohol or in little kids, ice cream and, and Skittles, how well can their body function? Not very well. We're, we're, we're not hitting all the, all the right things. Um, Birgit's going to come in just a couple seconds and talk to you about her focus on nutrition. But the last two shifts are functional fitness. If we move, if we get off of our couches and we actually move, our bodies work better. So that, that's what, I mean, I'm sure you've all heard that. My goodness, go to the gym and get up at 5 in the morning, go to the gym. Um, that's, that's a lot of, you know, I, I'm a former personal trainer as well. This is a lot of people's problems right there. And then the toxic burden. Um, we talked about, or Ann just talked a, a lot about uh, the, the different toxins in the well water and um, arsenic and as well as a number of things. She's got some really, really cool charts over there that, that show all the different foods. I actually give a toxins talk where we show you know, some of the most common foods. You know, a lot of the foods that moms feed their kids on a daily basis and think, hey, I'm making a healthy choice because the side of the package says, this is healthy. And they're smiley faces for kids or dinosaurs or something like that. But at the end of the day, you read the side of the label and there's MSG in it and there's propylene glycol in it, and which are not good things for kids. They actually destroy brain cells. There, there's uh, hydrogenated oils. Hydrogenated oils, for, if, if you're reading this out of a label and it says hydrogenated, stay away from it. It's a trans fatty acid. So um, that's how I go about getting the great results that we get in my office. Um, Birgit's going to come and talk to you for a couple of minutes about nutrition, and then I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give you some, some of the, uh, the case studies that I've had in my office, some of the kids that have come in, and what has happened to them, as well as... Um, a published study about an autistic child who actually got the diagnosis of autism reversed off of him um, under my care. So it's really, really fun.
Thank you, Dr. Jason. Well, as he said, I'm a nurse and I'm also a certified nutritionist and it's part of my own health journey that took me back into nutrition. Uh, I had some serious health issues. I worked in the hospital. I worked in critical care. And the crazy hours I kept, uh, I don't know if you're ever aware of medical field people tend to be the worst about taking care of themselves. And I crashed and I burned. And what helped me get back on track was nutrition and a little bit of alternative health. And I decided to go back to school and, and re-educate part of my training through nutrition for that. And I have a passion now for sharing nutrition with people and helping them optimize their health in that, in that way. It's a privilege for me to work in the office with Dr. Jason where we share that passion for nutrition. Um, I don't know if you're aware of it, but that your body is constantly building and generating new skin cells and uh, tissues all over the body. The average red blood cell has a lifespan of 120 days or just four months. Every second, 2.5 million red blood cells are destroyed and replaced. The life cycle of new skin is 27 days. It takes that long for it to go through the journey from the hypodermis to the epidermis. The average adult has 28 feet of intestines. And old cells are sloughed off and new ones are generated every three to six days, and theory has it that can be a little bit faster if you eat spicy foods. But I don't know if you're aware of it or not, but in the GI system, 70% of your immune system resides. And also, 75% of your serotonin is produced. Serotonin is a neurotransmitter, and you will not produce a healthy amount for stable brain and mood function if your GI system is damaged. Uh, so for our bodies to rebuild and regenerate, we have to have the right building blocks. How many of you heard, have heard the saying, you are what you eat, right? Well, I would, I would challenge that paradigm and I would say you're actually what you digest and absorb. If, you're, if your GI tract isn't functioning properly and you aren't digesting properly and you aren't absorbing your nutrition, you cannot rebuild and function optimally. In, I want you to consider this in the food industry. In 1972, our nation spent $3 billion on fast food. Fast forward that to 2000, Americans spent more than $110 billion on fast food. And this figure keeps rising. Americans now spend more money on fast foods than they do on higher education, personal computers, software, or new cars. They spend more on fast food than on movies, books, magazines, newspapers, videos, and recorded music combined. Today, 90% of the money Americans spend on food is spent on processed foods. That's astonishing. Is it possible that we've become a nation that is simultaneously overfed and undernourished? That is to say, you're getting plenty of calories, but you're lacking in nutrition. And I would suggest that's what's happening. That's what the statistics are showing. If we were to change that paradigm and we would spend our money on real food and consume what our bodies need to be healthy, I think we'd have a powerful change in our culture. And to think about how this would affect children, for example, the average American consumes more than 150 pounds of sugar in one year. Now, for an adult, that's a lot. But let's transpose that to a child with a smaller body mass index. And it's a much more profound effect, and we expect a good outcome on that. I'm not sure how that works. But in the office at Custom Health Center, we have a passion for pulling people back to the basics. And part of my job, and it's actually it's my pleasure, is to take people back and to re-educate them onto proper nutrition for themselves and their families. Thank you. Sounds like we've got a lot of work ahead of us, don't we? I'm glad that there's other people in the room, like Dr. Cowan and Ann, because I know that my office and Birgit and I, we definitely can't handle everybody. And, uh, and we, definitely, we, we need to team up with people like this, because we're all on the same mission together. Um, I told you I'd, I'd tell you a couple case studies, a couple of uh, stories of, of my patients. Um, you can go to the website that, that I've got um, up, and, and you can watch their testimonials on the website as well. Um, I, it's customhealthcenter.com. So customhealthcenter.com, you've got a couple of different um, case studies on there. You've got a, um, a video of Joe, and Joe came into my office after not leaving his house for two years. He hadn't left his house in two years. He's extremely anxious, extremely depressed. His wife, like, dragged him 
out of the house. And, and I had to meet with him after I closed at night because he literally would not leave the house. And so he would go out at night every once in a while. And so she dragged him in. We stayed late. And he started coming in at the very end of my shift every three times a week, very end of my shift. We worked a little bit on diet. We worked on, I presented the information for the five shifts. But within three months, Joe was coming out during the day. And I'm like, who, who is this? What are you doing? And, uh, and Joe, Joe actually has made such dramatic strides that he's got a full-time job. He is, he, is, um, he is a totally different person now from the first time I saw him by implementing like three of my shifts. If you do any of these things, you're gonna, they're all synergistic. They all help each other. Um, the next person is Joy. Joy, I, I saw Joy and um, she's been under my care for about eight months. She's lost 65 pounds. She's off of three depression medications and off of one anxiety medication. Um, she is, she's, a, again, a different person than the first person that I saw. Um, I've actually had the, the honor of getting published as well for my, my work with an autistic child. Um, this young man was four and a half years old when I first saw him. And the very first meeting with him, he, he spent the entire time pretty much hitting me. Um, and not wanting to do anything. He ran his head into the wall a number of times. Um, I, I was, I was, I'm praying the whole time. I'm like, I don't even know what to do with, with this young man. But we, we calmed him down and we, we started working. And I had mom remove all the gluten and casein out of his diet. That's the first thing I did. The next time I saw him, he was a totally different young man. Literally, just, just dietary changes alone. He was a totally different guy. And then we, what we did was we worked chiropractically from there um, with the new diet. We, we then worked chiropractically. And within eight months, this young man had the diagnosis of autism removed off of him, placed back into an, a normal classroom, and had, um, had great success. I, the last I heard, I haven't seen him in a while, but the last I heard, he's doing great. So, um, yeah, I, I, I want to tell you that there's... And, and the, there's science out there as well. There's, there are numerous studies. If you're interested in a case study, I've got a copy of, of that right over there on the, on the table. The last thing I want to do is, is give you guys the opportunity to come in and experience Custom Health Center for yourself. If you're interested, I'm giving anybody who was here tonight a gift card. This is a new patient gift card. It, it will you know, allow us to, to take you through the process of a new patient in the office. And then it will also allow you to, to you know, come back and, and see exactly what we found and if we can help you. So our table's right over there. Birgit will be sitting behind the table. Please feel free to, to set up an appointment, grab a gift card, come in on us. We'd love to, to pay for you for, for your first visit and then let you know if we can help, okay? Thank you. Excellent information there, Jason. Jason, when did you graduate? From, from Clarkson? I think I beat you by about 16 years. <laughs> All right, our featured speaker tonight is a local pharmacist. And I say local, he's an Orient Township dude, kind of a dapper guy. Uh, he works for C CVS, uh, Frank Granite. He uh, has written this book, uh, Over Medicating Our Youth, which is right there. And um, he started this, this coalition, the Coalition Against Over Medicating Our Youth. And he's, he, he's, he's, he's drawn a, la a line in the sand and he's starting to educate people. He's just doing it slowly. We're working on making this a groundswell across the nation and we're starting it right here. And we're trying to grow it to build hope for folks and tell them there are different things. Um, Frank, uh, according to Frank here, last June his book was featured at the National Education Association in Washington, D.C., and as well as the American Library Association in Anaheim, California. Um, he's going to be the featured speech speaker in an upcoming uh, discussion at the National Institute for Trauma and Loss in Children Practitioners Assembly. That's a lot of words. Um, during his 25 years in uh, the pharmaceutical, or in the pharmacy, in the, in the pharmacy business, uh, he's helped uh, children and folks, not only locally, but nationally. So I like to say, 
Please welcome up Frank, a very dapper dude. Thanks, Don. Good evening. Tonight's Health Awareness Forum has a very significant purpose. We are gathered here to discuss how effective assessments can help our children and young adults develop a healthy mind by ruling out underlying causation of behavioral symptoms due to nutritional, physiological, and environmental risk factors as described in the book, Over Medicating Our Youth. The manner in which our society assesses and treats children with behavioral conditions, including attention deficit disorder, as well as mental illnesses, is fundamentally and systematically flawed. Now, this is not only my view. This is the view of Johns Hopkins Medical School in Maryland, Department of Psychiatry and Behavioral Health Sciences, which is the number one rated medical school uh, in the United States by the World News Report. And many other prominent medical schools in our nation are starting to voice their concern. Tonight, our Health Awareness Forum, forum is even more significant because we recognize that thousands of children and young adults who have lost their battle to uncontrolled behavioral conditions, conditions that debilitate the functional mind, causing pain and agony. A year ago, tragedy struck my own family. Jeremiah was my son's very best friend throughout high school, throughout college. He was the second big brother to my five daughters. Tonight, Jeremiah, along with thousands of children and young adults, are looking to us, urging our society to make a positive change in the assessment and treatment process to help children develop a healthy mind. Now, before I get into the um, positive bioassessment interventions that we've been talking about, I would like to introduce tonight Jeremiah's mother, Mary Ann Rez. Good evening. I speak for all who suffer with or who has a loved one who has suffered with or just know somebody who suffered with a behavioral um, disorder or mental illness. I speak to you today as a mother of a son diagnosed with bipolar one, severe with psychosis. A mother who now mourns the loss of my son due to this devastating disease. My son's name is Jeremiah Hargett. Those who knew Jeremiah knew he was a fun-loving, energetic young man, full of life. He had the biggest, brightest smile that when he entered a room, he, it just lit up in a, a moment, a second. He had such an infectious, positive attitude that when you were around him for a minute, you couldn't help but feel positive yourself. He was an amazing dancer, and he didn't mind breaking out one of his famous dance moves <laughs> at any minute or, or place. He was an athlete. He had exceptional running abilities, and he earned a full ride scholarship to Oakland University for his talents in cross country. He motivated his friends and his family with inspiring words, and they counted on him for that. He was one of those people that, you, that just seem to never have a bad day. For Maya, this nightmare started when he was diagnosed with this mental illness. But for me as his mother, now looking back, it began early on with a gross series of events that fell through the cracks. The first of which started in mid-elementary school when a group of teachers um, approached me with the fact that Jeremiah was demonstrating behavioral patterns consistent with ADHD. They told me that I should um, get him diagnosed and put him on a medication um, regimen that might 
make him be able to focus better and be more calm and relaxed in class. As a concerned parent, I consulted with his uh, physician only be, to be told of the process that it would take for them to diagnose him. And in fact, the medication regimen at that time that he would be put on would be Ritalin. Being a parent who didn't believe in frivolously medicating my child, um, and who frankly didn't want to be in the system of uh, behavioral disorders and, and the whole medication process, um, I opted to not get him formally diagnosed and, um, and felt that we would deal with this as, as the best we could as a family. So that's what we did. We got him into uh, extracurricular sports and we, we took him from football to soccer and he developed a, um, uh, just to get his energy focused in, in, into an area so that he wasn't so, you know, energetic in school. So he developed the love for soccer and a passion, um, which brings me to my next event in his life. Um, it was there on the soccer field at the age of 13 that Jeremiah um, collided with another child running in for an air ball. Um, the child went down in pain and was taken off the field to be taken care of and um, Jeremiah, however, felt no pain. He just blacked out. When he came to, he seen that the game was in progress, so he just kept on playing as if nothing ever happened. The following morning, Jeremiah experienced his first grand mal seizure. We took him to the emergency room and they did a number of tests which consisted of CAT scan, MRIs, the, um, he was hooked up to the probes on his head and um, they determined that he had a minor concussion and um, they kept him on the, the probes and kept him for observation overnight in hopes that if he had another seizure they could test it further but he didn't. Um, so the following morning, the doctor approached me with a prescription for a long-term neurological medication. And again, being a mother that, that didn't want to medicate my child, I just didn't see the justification for this long-term neurological medication when it was just one seizure. So she seen that I was a little leery about it. She handed me the prescription. She told me if and when he has another seizure, you need to start him on this. And I took it and said, okay, so we left, and it wasn't until his third seizure, of course there was a little de denial on my part, that I said, okay, this is serious. We need to get him on this medication, and so we started um, this medication regimen. After tweaking his dosing and, and finding the right brand that worked for him, which was Keppra, during this whole time, I continued to have seizures, um, three seizures a month, like clockwork, uh, for exactly a year, almost to the day. At the age of 18 years old, Jeremiah was taken off the Keppra. At this point, he had been seizure-free for about four years. Several months after that, he began having behavioral patterns of what I now call uh, his downward spiral. He began having severe memory loss that went from forgetting what I told him to not even recognizing that we had even had the conversation. He became increasingly disorganized, his sleep pattern changed, and he began to not sleep for days at a time. He began having severe stress and anxiety attacks for which we took him to the emergency room for. Upon the emergency room visit, the doctor um, heard his symptoms and gave me a prescription for Xanax and Ativan and told us if we needed to add a sleep aid to that, we could do so to help him sleep if he was still having trouble. Jeremiah took this regimen for several days, but his patterns continued until he started um, hallucinating and seeing things that were not there. At this time, he was admitted to a lockdown unit at a mental health facility. This is where us as parents were taken out of the picture. As soon as the doors shut and locked behind us, we were 
they were free to treat him however they felt necessary. This was on a Friday morning. Um, the doctor seen him for all of 30 minutes and then classified him with the diagnosis of schizophrenia. They gave him a maximum dose of an antipsychotic drug. When I went to visit Maya, it broke my heart. I didn't recognize my son anymore. This was not Jeremiah. He could barely oh, lift his head from the table and I had to wipe the drool from his mouth. Jeremiah was now 18, an adult, with a diagnosed mental illness. An illness that alters your thought processes and takes you out of this reality into another reality. And still, this system trusted him to make informed decisions for his own care. His father and I felt like our hands were tied. We could no longer speak for him or make decisions for his care. We were not allowed to consult with a physician um, or have a, con a physician consult with us uh, about his, privately, about him, unless Jeremiah signed a paper at each and every visit or appointment. And if he didn't, because he was too medicated, then they would talk to Jeremiah, and if he remembered what they said, he would tell us, but usually he did not. Clearly, these laws need to change. How, I, I just don't understand how somebody whose thought processes are diagnosed with a, a, a illness who alters their whole thought process and takes them out of this reality into another, how can they be able to make decisions for themselves on any level? I didn't realize that this was a problem until I was right in the middle of it. And this is a whole issue in and of itself. But back to the point of concern, if we could go back as a child with a concern for ADHD, or back to the point of his first seizure, or even back to the point of that first emergency room visit for lack of sleep, stress, and anxiety. You see, these were, these were crucial, pinnacle moments in Jeremiah's life that had a comprehensive assessment been done to figure out the cause or dissect to get to the root of the problem. The ultimate outcome of suicide most likely would have been prevented. In the early years, of ADHD, something as simple as a tweak in his nutrition could have set him on the right path, or just looking into the family environment could have helped us to see issues that we couldn't necessarily see for ourselves. It could have made a huge impact on Jeremiah's life. At, at the point Excuse me. <laughs> At the point of that first emergency room visit, upon him not sleeping and having anxiety, had somebody just looked into it just a little bit further and did something like the scan, they could have found a whole nother issue. Now, sorry. Now I'm not saying that Jeremiah wouldn't have not have need, would have not needed to take any medications. Surely, he needed his psychiatric medication regimen. I'm just, I'm trying to say that the dependency and the need for it might not have been so great, as well as, as it would have been implemented more safety, safely and effectively. Comprehensive assessment and analysis is so important for so many reasons. One in particular is that it, it puts everybody on the same page. It allows physicians, for educators, and even for yourselves as parents to get involved and really know your child through their course of treatment. And should things progress later in life, 
there will already be documentation that allows safer medication treatment. Parents, I cannot stress enough just to know your child. You are front and center in their care and treatment. Educate yourself, do your research. This, this book is the best way to start. Don't sit passively and allow physicians to offer medication as the only solution and the only form of treatment because it's not a cure, it's a, it's a Band-Aid. You yourself advocate for your child to find out what's causing such behaviors in them. And most importantly, don't drop the ball when your child reaches the adult age of in between 18 and 22 years old, especially if you have a male child, a, a boy. These are the, the most crucial years for them. These are the years that they're gonna need your utmost attention to their mental health because these are the years of attack. Because when it's you that don't recognize your child anymore, it may very well be too late at that point. So, thank you. Thank you, Marianne. Before we can discuss an effective behavioral process, we should understand why America is facing a childhood behavioral health crisis. Chapter two of the book, Evolution of the Health Crisis in America describes in detail why suicide is the second leading cause of death in our college student population. Why American children and young adults consume three times the ADD stimulant and psychiatric medications than the world's children combined according to Scientific American. Why the Food and Drug Administration placed all ADD stimulant and psychiatric medications on their MedGuide alert warning list. And finally, why the United States Senate Committee for Government Affairs authorized the Government Accountability Office to conduct a two-year drug audit against prescribing physicians within the child foster care system. Assessment of behavior alone can no longer be the sole criteria for diagnosing children with severe behavioral symptoms, wherein the causation of condition is ignored. The book, Overmedicating Our Youth, discusses the action plan for ch childhood behavioral conditions. This plan involves ruling out causation of symptoms due to nutritional, physiological, and environmental risk factors. Now, I had a whole litany of things I was going to get into, but we pretty much heard what we need to do. And I'll even go into behavioral health with respect to the nutrition. I want to hit on that real quick. Uh, diabetes type 2 is rapidly growing in our country, and when we look at diabetes and the onset, this doesn't happen overnight. This is a progressive, like you heard Dr. Cowan and Dr. Olufsen, and um, uh, Birgit McQuiston and Anne. This process of a child's mental development capacity, it takes time, and if we don't interact at an early age with our kids, um, the end result is suicide rates are escalating in our country, violent behaviors are escalating in our country. And I just wanted to reiterate uh, things that we're doing with the coalition against over-medicating our youth. Uh, one of our um, active, uh, those of you who have not signed up for our newsletter, it's a free newsletter, please go to overmedicatingouryouth.com, uh, sign up, it's free. Uh, Jill Kralik, she's one of our um, editors of the newsletter, she's a local teacher here in uh, Lake Orion, Michigan, uh, at an elementary school. She's a reading teacher, and she's getting a lot of data regarding the upcoming newsletter and past new newsletters that we've had that basically auditory uh, perception disorders, um, sensory perception disorders in children at a young age um, are basically in line with the symptoms of ADHD diagnosis. So 
There's a lot of things that are, uh, that are happening across the country and with our own coalition, and I would encourage you to get involved, whether you be a, a parent, an educator, um, physician, traditional versus alter alternative uh, medical care. Get involved in the movement because it's not going to stop. When you have Johns Hopkins Medical School doing this for years, changing the way children are comprehensively assessed, it's not going to stop. And finally, most importantly, uh, the company I work for, CVS Caremark Pharmacy, based in Rhode Island, they are a leader. They recognize things need to change with abuse and medication. A uh, perfect example with the suicide rates increasing right now, um, children and parents do not realize the detriment with these powerful anti-ADHD um, medications. They're powerful stimulant drugs. Uh, children don't realize that, teenagers especially, their diet, their drinking caffeinated products, they're taking over-the-counter decongestants, cardiovascular deaths with ADD stimulant drugs are on the rise. Things have to change. Teachers, educators, administrators within every school district in our country need to wake up and stop ignoring the problem. It's just not alcohol and marijuana. CVS Pharmacy, Caremark in Rhode Island, they are the chief sponsor of the Medicine Abuse Project affiliated with drugfree.org. Uh, locally here in West Bloomfield, the regional office has sponsored the coalition against over-medicating our youth. Tonight, I ask you locally and nationally to help children and families in need by sharing our free information. Visit our website, overmedicatingouryouth.com, view the book, and join the coalition and the movement. Thank you, good night. Before we end up, you know, there's also the tables over here, you can go check everything out. The essential oil smells good. If you have questions for anybody, now's a good time. Uh, well, you know, Jason, uh, Birgit, Ann, John, and whatever your name is, Frank, why don't you guys come up here? And uh, if you have questions, Tony, you look like you had a question. I just knew it. Um, go ahead. Feel free to ask him. Uh, about, uh, I think, almost a year ago, uh, my son, my teachers, uh, or his teachers, talked to me about attention, um, being, uh, not being able to focus, not being organized, all those and they, they brought up ADHD. I never went to a doctor. Uh, I did their assessment that they had here in the Lake Orion School District, uh, which was basically a questionnaire. Uh, Can you, I'm sorry, what was your name? Uh, Tony Lash. Tony, can you go what you just said about assessment? What exactly did the school do? Was it, tell, I want everybody. Okay, what they did is they, I mean, the, the teachers had talked to me about these various issues um, that they that were saying they're seeing in the classroom and uh, hyperactivity, uh, not being able to sit still, not being able to concentrate. So they brought in, a, I forgot, it's the school coordinator, I guess it's kind of like a social worker. Okay. And the two teachers that he had, uh, along with the uh, school coordinator, talked to me, discussed, and asked what I would like to do. Um, they said it looked like symptoms of ADHD. Um, and so they, I said, well, they, they said that they had an assessment that they could do. Mm -hmm. and, and then I could take that information and do whatever I wanted with it. The assessment, and I told Don on a phone call, I thought it was very subjective. I thought it was, I wasn't impressed with it. I, if I remember correctly, it was 10 to 15 questions. Each of his two teachers did it individually and then I was to do it, and then they would take those three assessments and I, you know, assess the numbers and then tell you whether they think he's ADHD. Okay, I get it. Here's the thing, and this is why I set up this forum tonight. We have pharmacy, we have somebody that goes after toxins, and Ann and actually um, Dr. Olofsson and Birgit do that as well. And you have probably, a, a, probably the most dynamic chiropractor in the state of Michigan before you tonight. What your child was 
subjected to, and that's why my last comment about the school districts in our country better change and not just do behavioral assessment. Your child was only assessed for behavior. Now, behavior is fine for an assessment purpose. What we're talking about is bio-assessments, okay? And what's gotta happen, what we talked about tonight, and it goes even more in depth in the book, bio-assessments for children, especially at a young age, has to be the mandate. School districts will wake up. Jill Kralik on our uh, newsletter, we have a special edition coming out for the holidays. It's gonna be the first weekend in December. It's gonna be jam-packed with assessments, bio-assessments. And it's gonna help a lot of parents out. You're basically, what I'd like all parents to realize, and educators, because we're in this together, it's, I just, I don't like, I don't like administrations passing the buck, especially when it comes to kids. Now, on that note, the classroom has to be protected, and I, I agree with that, okay? We have to have control in the classroom, but the information we have coming out first weekend in uh, December is called the Pathway to Action, and it has all these bioassessments in there that we're talking about, and that's the first step. Nutrition is huge, whole foods diet, uh, we had mention of gluten, things like that, so. Well, the question I had was, I didn't go to a doctor, I didn't even pursue medication. Um, actually, my mother went, happened to be vacationing in South Carolina, and she found uh, a seminar that she went to, and it was about neurofeedback. Yep. And I was just wondering if you guys were familiar with neurofeedback, because that's what my son has uh, did, uh, I think it was 10 weeks, 20 sessions of neurofeedback, and he's had a lot of success. Is that, so Ann, do you want to comment on that, Ann? The neurofeedback part? Yeah, yeah, sure. Was that like about toxins or just neuro? No, I just, what's that? Is, is it visual? Uh, yeah. Yes, it's visual. It's all working with the pathway, brainwave activity. That's what Jill, right now, we have uh, the visual disturbances is what it's called. Uh, it, that's going to be in our newsletter. She had an art, we had an article in the uh, last newsletter as well. but. That's significant. I, I found mean, a chiropractor that did it as a, it's a, it's a patented form of neurofeedback. Do you want to come in? We, yeah. John, is there like a, a two miles in Clarkson? Is that what that is? A what? A two, there's, a, there's a place in Clarkson called a two in mine. Yes. And they have, they. It's off of Washington, yeah. right? Yeah, well, I, I can give you guys information of what I, yeah. It's it's based on an EEG of brainwaves. Yes, and, it's and looking it, at the four brain waves. They're altering the brainwaves between right. alpha and the beta through, waves to save uh, lives. Yes, exactly. And it's through uh, visual stimulation. And That's uh, how they learn control. What's that? That's how they learn to control. Yeah, it's, 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 it's yeah. been, I've had, oh, it's, it's been very successful. That's oh, what I was trying to get and heard it. So. Thank you for sharing that. Yeah. I, was, I just like to say, it. my daughter has the opposite. She's ADD or ADHD that is very laid back, quiet, very um, inattentive. Yes, and when she, she just lacks focus and, and a lot of, um, you know, her uh, processing time is kind of slow. And, um, it took a long time before the school was diagnosed from her. Actually, they didn't even want to diagnose her. They just said she's lazy, you know, and she's capable and but she's lazy or uh, unorganized, all this. I had to do all the research, and then I had to take it to my doctor. And they test her ears and her eyes, and, and um, you know, physically she's fine. However, they sent me the questionnaire to send to the school, and they filled out behavioral, how she, you know, she's, you know, the pattern. And all her teachers filled it out, but it took like four years for them to come to the conclusion that she had a, uh, a learning disability that was ADD or ADHD. Um, and still today, you know, she, we tried fish oil, we tried diet, and now she doesn't want to do any of those, so we've started the medicine. So I, how, about bio, I, how about the bioassessments we're talking we about? We never did the bioassessments. No, we didn't do chiropractic and any of that stuff, and now I'm wondering if, you know, I didn't know yeah. about those. But I did hear about the visual and... Um, but Tony, right? Yeah. What he said about the visual perception disorders, they mimic ADHD to, you know, a lot of those disorders do. So that's a bio-assessment. Mm -hmm. 
you know, stuff like that needs to be researched, your chiropractic care, right. bioenergy feedback, et cetera. So. From that, if I'm not mistaken, isn't there a chapter in the book also about um, process fade? Now, I'm on medication. My child's on medication. I mean, you just don't want to <coughs> cold yeah. turkey cut things off. There is a, a step, a process to go through. It, it, yeah, I describe it in the, it's the public awareness guide. So if your child is on medication, it's not a problem. The, what we have to do is still, you know, keep the child stable as best you can, but now you have to start. Locally, you, we should all be proud of people. These are some of the best people locally, and they're right, right around the corner. So our objective as a coalition is not to basically start here, and then nationally, I mean, New York City right now, we we got a lot of movement right now. So. For your child, now you need to step it up. You know, get into the bioassessments. That's what the key is. And right. two newsletters ago, I talked about that bioassessment versus behavioral. See, sort of the problem is, is up till now, there's never been a portal. Where do you start? Right. And who do you go see? Right. I mean, I you can like come see all five of us one at a time. Yourself. But that's yeah. You challenge yourself because you start thinking, am I a bad person? <clears throat> my, you know, even my husband was against me to get her tested for ADHD. You know, or ADD, because oh, that's going to follow her on her school record, and it's going to—that's you know, it's bad, bad, bad. But I'm like, she's got to be an adult one day. She's yeah. got to function on her own and hold a job one day. You know, she's going to be someone else's mother one day. Yeah. You, you know, you have to work with them, and you, that's why I kept going. You, you cannot blame yourself. From I, the time a child is born, that like <clears throat> Dr. Collins said earlier, or Jason, and Dr. Olafson. That birthing process alone for that child is very traumatic, structurally, cognitive, functionally, et cetera. And you don't know as a parent, they bring the child out. You know, I did, I had the pleasure of six different times <laughs> in a nice warming bath, and everybody says, oh, he's totally healthy. Mm -hmm. You don't know that, we don't know that, no. Right. And it takes time. So when these little behavior uh, issues come up, we should be diligent. And that's what I want, the educational system change direction one of the things that i see a lot in my office is is people coming in totally unaware of what chiropractic is first of all so we and i'm sure that dr cowan sees this on a daily basis as well the you know basically as a chiropractor uh, yes neck and back pain can go away but but my my biggest goal is to get your body to function more properly to reconnect the brain to the body and so if, if during the birthing process, we're, we're all supposed to have a curve in our neck that looks about like this. And so if during the birthing process, you take a baby whose ligaments are, are not holding very well yet and muscles, they have no muscle control yet, and you turn them and then pull, a lot of times what happens is that, that curve that was supposed to be there is perfectly straight. A C-section baby has got 40 to 70 pounds of pressure being put on a neck as, as you come out of mom. And so what happens is those, those delicate nerves in the neck, as Dr. Cowan said earlier, um, can be damaged. They can, they can actually be stretched on. And if we've got stretching and pulling on nerves, it decreases how much information is getting from your brain and going down to your body, or how much information is going from your body and getting back up to your brain. So, if we've got, you know, it's like living in a, in a room with a candle on in the corner. You know, you, you can st see things around, but you're, you're still in a dull room. You can't see, you can't read everything on, on the walls and all of that stuff. And that's what a lot of the patients that I see with, with ch children with learning disabilities and stuff like that. And they, I, I'm telling you, Burgett can attest to this. We've got little kids coming in and out of the office, getting adjusted all day, every single day. And the parents are blown away because these little itty bitty gentle adjustments to their child's neck, these kids turn on, they light up. Whoa, they're, you know, all of a sudden for the first time, they're, they're starting to, to focus in school. And for the first time, they're, they're um, not, you know, not um, having issues with, with their bodies and, and stuff like that. So uh, illnesses, chronic illnesses and, and allergies, they, they all go away in my office. I'm not saying that all of them every time go away because it might not be related to the, the nerves. But man, I see so much improvement that every single person should get checked to see if they have nerve, nerve issues because man, why would you wanna live life with nerve issues and, and thinking that you had to take a medication if all it is is, is a, a nerve being stretched or pulled on in your neck.
deodorants or whatever coming through all the all the toxins and trying to release those toxins yeah. and doing a diet like a fine gold diet mm -hmm. for a year and a half or something like that and nothing is working. How do you know where to go back now again and start without, like you said, seeing every one of you simultaneously? Go from part A, the worst point, if you will, and then look at now and see where the assessment is. Have you tried the chiropractic yet or no? No. That, yeah, that has to be done. Uh, stay with the whole foods diet. That's the best way to go. The high antioxidant, the phytonutrients, etc. Uh, fish oil is key. And even with little, because I want to make this point, Dina from uh, Oils for Healthy Living has, fish oil is part, it should be part. Even if it's part of the nutritional package, if, even if it's not nutrition, child still should be on it because essential fatty acids for behavioral illnesses are critical. So the child should be on it if they're still presenting. So I would still be diligent with it, keep going, keep plugging away. Chiropractic that hasn't been assessed yet, needs to be done. Go back to the, get another baseline if it's been over a year with the energy feedback toxic study, do it again. See, you need baselines because you, where you were, you should have that report. Okay, I had this type of baseline with toxic activity, now I'm here. You should keep track of that as, as time goes on. And then the other thing is the child can actually grow out of it. And what do you do once you get that time? You talked about um, products. First you assess and mm -hmm. then you compare the product. What are those products? Is that well, the products are vitamins, minerals, herbs, depending on you know what the person needs. I have a list of uh, uh, of you know different herbs and different things that have helped to drain the system. As some herbs work more with draining toxins and draining central organs, what I try to do is help with an overall drainage first to make sure that everything is moving. Because if I'm going to move a toxin, it's going to come out of a certain spot, but it's got to have somewhere to go. So we make sure that the bowels are working well and make so those are some kind of herbs that help that. And also make sure they're eating and drinking enough water because the water is necessary for the bowels to move and also for the kidneys to, so we gotta make sure if we're gonna move any toxins that they're actually going to come out. They're not gonna just move from one spot in the body to another and sit still. And so we have to uh, make sure the bowels are moving well, to make sure that there's enzymes in the food, in the you know, the digestive enzymes, because you use digestive enzymes to help break down food, and the uh, digestive enzymes are actually taken in by the large intestine. <coughs> if you have enough, then it will actually reabsorb into the bloodstream, taken to the liver and the pancreas, and relabeled into 2,000 other enzymes that are then used for other things besides digestion. Because the one of the other ways the body communicates is through enzymes. So there's, there's a lot of different things. You want to you know, start with some basics of making sure that there's enough water and that the, you know, everything's coming out the way it should. I think what everybody's saying is, is you have to try and take your body to ultimate function. And that's basically where we all sort of miss it because it's too easy to take a pill to cover up a pain or an ache or a symptom rather than look in the mirror and say, okay, Here's some things I need to change. Here's some lifestyle habits I need to change. Uh, maybe the food that I'm buying, maybe the coloring in it, maybe that's part of the problem. You know, just starting to take a bigger picture of things and say, does, does this, and it categorize it, does this improve my immune system or does it weaken my immune system? What, what can I do to enhance it? Question. I've had this conversation with a number of people, this is why I ask it. Uh, the drugs are covered by insurance. I assume these things are not covered by insurance, so they are? In some states they are, but not in Michigan. Because the neurofeedback wasn't covered by insurance, right. and that's why I've had a lot of time when I've talked to some people about it. Well, chiropractic is included in insurance coverage. Okay, it um, is. Yeah. Excluded? Yeah. No, no, it's all limited. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It, um, but hers is not, correct? There's no code okay. to be able to apply it to insurance. What you'll find is... Is there any conversation being had? No, what you'll find is, is anything that has to do with prevention is not covered. That's the reason when I read that article from the Case Foundation, mm -hmm. 
He said, we don't have a health care system, we have a sickness care system. So it's like having, it's like saying life insurance. You gotta die. <laughs> it's not life insurance. And so it's, 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 it's these oxymorons that we keep buying all the time. Yeah. That system, by the way, is by design. But that's a whole different world. Yeah, that's a whole different world. But I think it possibly can be covered by the plus account. Like, sure. Like, I th please. Well, yeah. yeah. But not every employer offers a. But the bottom line is what, what price do you put on health? And, um, you know, is it better to have that shiny red car in the parking lot or is it better to look at your kids and think, well, you know, since we're buying the right foods now and things like that, well, Johnny's changing. Um, it, that's what I just said a minute ago about the port. They're, that's the problem with this. That's, I think that's why Frank has started all this. As of right now, there is no portal. There really isn't a starting point. And it's like you're sitting here tonight and you're trying to understand, okay, I, I've got this concept and I understand these things, but like you just, where do you start? You don't know that. Um, I, I think as Frank develops here with this thing, he's going to start to include more of this portal because we all do need an, uh, an entry point. And uh, I loved his idea of a differential diagnosis um, before throwing the label ADD or ADHD on a child. Um, you know, there's just, you know, it's, it's like we have bought the concept of general hospital on television and so on, that, that this is the only answer. When in all the time there's all these other different things out there that, that keep us healthy. And, um, and that's where we need to focus. And a, and a sluggish system to me is, I'm certainly not computer literate, my wife will tell you that back there, but it's, it, it reminds me of a computer that needs to be rebooted. And if that's our system and that's the way our system is working and we need to be rebooted, these are some of the mechanisms that we would use to reboot ourselves. We would eat properly, we would breathe properly, we'd make sure our weight isn't there, we'd exercise, and so on, we'd make sure we don't smoke. We get down to the basics, and that's very hard stuff to tell the people. And most people don't hear that. Well, you know, there's gotta be an easier way. You know, well, there is no easy way. And so, anyway, Frank's on the front line of this thing, and he's out there trying to develop this portal and these directions for, for all these people to move, because yeah, I, I, he didn't say this yet, I don't believe, but this, 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 the, the number that outstand, is so outstanding to me is, we went from 1990 or 1987 to a half a billion dollars a year that was spent in our country on psychotropic drugs up to a hundred billion dollars in just 25 years. That's 200 times increase. Well, do that many people have ADD? I'm 29 but I get this fake ID that says I'm gonna be 65 in another month. And so I look back and I say, well, where, where were all these people at when I was in high school? Was it Mr. Mitek? Mr. Mitek was the assistant principal. And back in those days, you got a spanking if you went down to the office. And so right away, your, your attitude changed. If you had a behavior problem, you, you, you were gonna change it. And, but, but nowadays, you know, things are a lot different. And, uh, but anyway, the, the, the portal, that's, that's, that's to me the most important thing that Frank's developing here is, is, is giving people a direction. Because right now, where's the direction? Is there any student that has a question? Anybody? Students? Else? See Dina because she's foils for healthy living. Now we talked about fish oil and how a little child they become diagnosed with ADD or have behavioral issues. And I and that's why I met her a few weeks back. How are we going to get this big, ugly tasting fish oil in this child, this five year old? But they got good flavored, healthy fish oil supplements, high potency. So that's why she's here tonight. She's had a whole host of other things there. So. Any other questions? You can go, uh, I think each and everybody's going to be at their own little tables there. You can go talk to them individually if you want, you know, feel more comfortable doing that. Uh, otherwise, uh, thanks for coming out. Hopefully we'll have more of these kind of things as the uh, days and months and years go by. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.